Hello everyone, and in this video I want to take some time and discuss a, a video game that I'm very much looking forward to, known as Task Force Admiral, being developed by Dry Dock Dream Games and to eventually be published by Microprose. So I've been following the, the development of this game for the past uh, you know year, year and a half, or two years, and it's got me really, really excited. So Back in, I think it was July of 2022, just a couple months ago at the time I'm making this, they released a uh, gameplay footage video, a gameplay feature video. So I want to actually go through that video and I'm going to pause it at certain times and discuss the things that I'm seeing, some of my questions that I might have, some hopes and, you know, maybe small criticisms, bearing in mind that this is all very much a work in progress. So they're still, you know, ironing out a lot of the details and working on a lot of the gameplay mechanics. So this is not in any way representative of the final product, but I'm just going to give some thoughts on it and some things that I see um, in terms of features and maybe some decisions they've made so far. Uh, before we start, I should also note that I'm not, you know, receiving any money or sponsorship from Microprose or Dry Dock Dream Games or anything. This is purely based on my own interest in this game. Okay. And furthermore, I guess um, this game is, is, I think, is very much in my wheelhouse. Um, one of my passions when it comes to researching uh, naval history in particular is the Pacific theater, right? Uh, the Pacific Naval War, right? Not so much the island hopping, although that does factor into it, you know, but, you know, how, you know, the, the Imperial Japanese Navy and the U.S. Navy in the Pacific. That's, that's something that I have been researching and reading about and studying for quite some time now, and like 90% of my personal library is books on the Pacific War. So, you know, Battles of Midway and Wake and Guadalcanal and so on and so forth, right? Leyte Golf, you know, take your pick. Okay, that's my wheelhouse, so to speak. Yes, I know, of course, you know, Battle of the Atlantic, Europe, the Western Front, the Eastern Front, Mediterranean, North Africa, Italy, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, something happened over there, you know, something dealing with some guy called Hitler, you know, Mussolini, Churchill, and I don't know, some, you know, something like that. No, uh, yeah, my research interest is firmly centered on the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Pacific War. So that's something. So, hey, this is like the game for me, I think. Now, I am cautiously optimistic about this game. It's, I'm very much looking forward to it, and I think it has a lot to offer. But as, you know, if like Cyberpunk 2077 has taught us anything, things can seem very, very promising, but they come up short come time for release. So uh, I'm, I'm withholding my expectations so far. And, you know, it, this game may turn out great. It may not. From my understanding, the development team is very small. Like, it's like four or five people. It's tiny. So, but they are putting a lot of love and hard work into this game, and they are focusing on historical accuracy. And furthermore, they have designed this game to be very scalable and configurable in terms of how detailed you want it to be. If you want more of an arcade style of gameplay, you can turn on all the assists. If you want something that's like diehard simulation war game esque, right, where you really have to like put in the time to do the research and the studying to, you know, and understand that not everything is have tons of fog of war and all that, you know, yes, you can have that. So this game is a a simulation of World War II carrier task force operations. So kind of let that sink in, right? And I think it kind of more or less operates on a tactical and an operational level, so to speak. So, you know, it's not necessarily grand strategy, um, but it kind of operates sort of from like the 15,000 foot view on down. So obviously, given the name of the game, you're not commanding any singular ship, you're commanding a task force. So you're not going to be actually there driving the boat, so to speak. You're not going to be flying the planes. You're going to be commanding you know, a formation of ships, you know, if you want more detailed tactical simulators, you know, then go off and play those types of games. So if you want to command a destroyer, then go play destroyer U-boat hunter. If you want to command a submarine, then go off and play silent hunter. So, but this is not that, those games. Those, this is a operations simulation, so to speak. Anyway, so uh, with all that said, 
let's get on with it. Like I said, I'm going to uh, stop and um, pause the video and give some thoughts as we go through it. Welcome aboard USS Yorktown, Admiral. The flight pod is an interactive interface connecting your command stations. It serves as a hub, and clicking on its elements allows you to navigate between the main gameplay functions. All right, pausing it right there. So this is really cool. I know they put a lot of time and effort into the, literally just building this entire space, the flag plot. So I think this does goes a long way towards adding immersion to the game, right? Giving you the feel that like, hey, this is where the Admiral would be. They would probably be working with a sizable staff to, you know, organize things within the task force, everything from the aircraft to the other vessels and ships in the task force and so on and so forth. So I like this view. It provides a, a degree of uh, verisimilitude, if you, if you will. One question I do have, though, is will there be other kind of in-world views, so to speak? Now, as we're going to see in this video, there's going to be like third-person views of like the ships, but you know, since you're aboard a carrier, will you be able to get the view of the action from other uh, positions on the carrier, maybe on the bridge or, you know, kind of overlooking the flight deck, so to speak, right? I mean, third person view is great, but when I think third person view of ships, it's nice to see the models, you know, and all their 3D glory and all that. But in my opinion, a third person perspective is a bit immersion breaking so to speak. You know what I mean? Like, for example, let's take the, the game Destroyer Hunter, right? U-Boat Hunter, right? That's an immersive game because, you know, you can stand on the bridge and you feel like, oh, this is what it would, look, would have looked like at the time, you know? Or maybe you're in the CIC. You know, this is what the CIC would have looked like in the various stations and all that. So that's an immersive game. Or take Carrier Command 2, right? Where you're standing on the bridge of that and you're running around the bridge to various stations, right? That's an immersive game. It feels like you're on board a warship. Third person perspective of warships doesn't really do it for me. That's cool. That's fine. And I'm all for it because I do want to see the, the models. But I also want that kind of first person perspective immersion, like what we're seeing right now. This is what I like. But I'm curious, will we be able to see different um, parts of the carrier from like a first person perspective, right? We'll be, we be able to stand on like Vulture's Row and view the flight operations from there. So I think, um, you know, seeing like a, a, an enemy, you know, a dive bombing attack or torpedo attack come at you from those perspectives would be really not only very immersive, but also quite scary, you know, <laughs> right? Seeing these dive bombers scream down at, at your carrier and yeah. That's uh, that would be something. So I'm hoping that there's other views other than the flag plot from the kind of first person perspective, so to speak. Anyway, moving on. At the bottom, the radio log and air ops timeline are always available during gameplay. They keep you updated about incoming communications and ongoing air operations. A game session exists within a detailed 3D world. Each ship and aircraft in the air or landed present on the map is active at all times. Okay, now obviously we have this three-dimensional view, right? We can zoom in and zoom out to the entire task force. We can zoom in on individual ships and all that. So um, again, it's, it's really awesome to see these nice 3D models. They put a lot of work into these. I've seen, there's another video out there where you see one actually build, someone build a ship. I think they're using Blender or something, you know, a 3D modeling program basically starting from scratch and it's, you know, they put a lot of work into these models, I will say. One critique I have, again, this is a work in progress, so, you know, things are bound to change, but um, the textures, I think, could use another go through. Um, some parts of it look a little flat or bland, a little plasticky, if you will, like take these, um, what look like 20 millimeter gun tubs right here on the side here. Um, it's a very flat texture. So I'm hoping that some of these check textures can be improved and have more detail added onto them. Or maybe it's, it's a function of like the camera distance from the model, right? So maybe the more you zoom in, the more detailed it gets. And the more you zoom out, the less detailed it gets. Okay. So maybe that's just a function of the, the camera and where it is in relation to the model. So that might be it. But 
Um, yeah, I think some of the textures look a little bit flat. Just saying. But I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they'll be improved. <laughs> they probably will be improved. The water looks nice, I should say. It's really cool that you can see the wake of these ships for a good distance. Yeah. Um, Weather will have an effect in this game, not only on flight operations, but I think presumably just sailing in general. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, are we going to be able to like, you know, model like a freaking typhoon or something, you know, big, heavy seas and wind and rain and lightning and all that or whatever, you know, are we going to be like sailing through a storm or whatever, going through squalls or whatnot? Yeah. And is that going to change the, the handling of these ships, you know? My problem with a lot of games, particularly naval games, is that it feels like the ships are moving on this glassy, smooth plane, so to speak. And the water is really just a texture, you know, like World of Warships. You know, there's a reason I just don't play that game anymore, because it just feels like the ships are moving along this glassy, smooth surface, right? The water is literally just a texture. It has no bearing on the handling of the ship itself, right? And contrast this with, say, like, you know, a game like Carrier Command 2, where you're literally, like, you know, getting thrown around in, like, 80-foot seas the whole freaking time, you know? But there's an actual physics model to the water in Carrier Command 2. So I'm wondering, will the um, the physics, the handling of the these ships, will it change depending on the, the weather, the state of the sea and all that, you know? Um, you know, if the seas are really bad and it's just really horrible weather, you're not going to be able to conduct air operations aboard a carrier. So will there be scenarios where, where that will not, where that will be the case, so to speak? Huh. You know, not every day in the Pacific was bright and sunny and clear, <laughs> you know. So I'm wondering, you know, will weather and the state of the sea play a more heavy factor in this? Now, from my understanding, it will, at least the weather part, but hmm. I don't know. It remains to be seen. Let's move on. What you are allowed to see in the 3D world is defined by your difficulty and realism settings. In this demonstration, we will allow the player to view enemy forces without restriction. All right. So um, looking at the menus at the top screen, right? We see we went to um, one of the menus and we can jump around to various units, which is pretty cool. Okay. So you can use the menus at the top. We also see things like worldview, tactical map, strategic map, room, uh, formation, flight management, command chain, ship, view, focus, camera, and settings. And I'm guessing uh, after that, on the right there is the currently selected unit, its speed, and a debug console. I don't think the Shokaku is going 47 knots. I don't think she could even make that speed, you know? Yeah, whatever. Anyway, maybe it's like centimeters per second or something i don't know but <laughs> anyway yeah you get what i'm saying um room there up top that that menu of room might be what i was wondering about like can we see different you know first person perspectives of different parts of the ship so to speak so maybe that that's the room menu up there huh i don't know i mean you know we got the 3D world, we got the tactical map, we got the strategic map, the world view, I think. Um, maybe world view is what we're currently on, like 3D world. Maybe that's what it is. The other ones are fairly self-explanatory, formation, flight, and so on. So, yeah, interesting. Hmm. This Shikaku-class carrier is your adversary today. We will not engage her, but we will have aircraft spar with hers in a few minutes from now. She is actually at a view range from our formation and will appear as an unidentified echo on the sensors of the task force when in radar range, extended for this demo. The okay, yes, so I noticed that the menu up there, it um, grays out in the current menu that you are in. So yes, the 3D world must be the world view. And now we're in the tactical view, in which case tactical map is grayed out. Okay, that makes sense. Tactical view can be accessed at any time by pressing the spacebar. It shows a simplified 3D depiction of the world and allows you to give tactical orders. It is easy to navigate and acts as a hybrid interface between the strategic map, not depicted today, and the 3D world proper. Okay, so it sounds like you're going to be giving a good amount of orders from the tactical view, at least in with regard to your formation here. Uh, my question is, what kinds of orders will those be with the tactical view? Hmm. So, yeah. 
Um, obviously, what we see here, we see various icons. In reality, these little uh, I- these blue icons above the ships, they're um, they're like officers' shoulder boards, right? So you see like um, three stars here, two stars there, you know, one star there, and so on and so forth, right? Um, that actually would denote rank, but obviously, I think in this in this case, it's denoting what I presume are flagships of various formations within the or various um, uh, groups within the task force, so to speak. So. But anyway, I'll I'll get into that in just a minute. But yeah, it's pretty cool that they kind of base these um these these um uh units off, these models here off of um uh the Fletcher Platt Pratt war game models, right? Heavily used in the 1930s. Yeah. So <laughs> kind of very clever, very um, you know, nice nod to history to traditional naval war gaming. Yeah. Now we're back to our own force. It is centered on its flagship, carrier USS Yorktown. This ship is part of a larger formation, Task Force 17, or TF-17. It's self-divided into smaller task groups and divisions. As the flag officer, you are basically a passenger aboard USS Yorktown. You manage all the ships, aircraft, and men placed under your command. The fleet management screen is the first mode of the fleet plot. It allows you to browse the specs of all your ships and tactical groups. It allows you to access the status and damage reports of each and every ship. The contents of this module are still a work in progress, but that's how it will feel like. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. and It shows like how detailed I think some of the, the aspects of this game will be, right? You have an entire, you can look at any, presumably any ship in this task force, click on any of them on the left there and get details on the vital aspects of the ship. What, what's happening in terms of damage control, whether it can make way, whether it's taking much damage, how much fuel and ammo it has. And, you know, not to mention the menus down here on the bottom here, what systems are operational, what their status is and so on and so forth. Right. So in various administrative things like that. So. Um, yeah, just going in, there's a heavy amount of detail here in terms of the uh, the formation and the fleet information here. So that's looking uh, very interesting. This brings about the question of um, if things like fuel and ammo are going to be an issue, um, is logistics going to play a factor in this game, so to speak? Kind of later on in the war, one of the major things that allowed the U.S. Navy to remain you know, operational and at sea for so long, particularly the carrier groups at sea, you know, was fleet man, um, fleet logistics, right? There were, there were entire, uh, fleet logistics service groups, you know, groups of ships, you know, of like oilers and supply ships and ammo ships and all that. These were all just dedicated units to just supplying the the beans, the bombs, the bullets and and the fuel to, the carriers and the destroyers and the battleships and the cruisers of the fleet, right? So is this game going to feature underway replenishment to some extent, or is that going to be more abstracted? I wonder. Huh. So, right, as they say, um, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. And logistics was an often overlooked, but it was a major, major component of the U.S. Navy's success in the pacific you're dealing with the largest ocean on the planet and you know you often you're fighting far away from any port or repair facilities so you got to be able to supply the fleet and with the addition of floating dry docks and all this other stuff right so hmm i i wonder how much logistics are going to be a part of this game or if it's just going to be you know kind of abstracted to the point where like oh, okay battle's over you know, and um, it just throws up a page and says like, okay, you want this many, you want to resupply or whatever, you know, I don't know. Uh, or is it going to get more technical, more um, detailed and have something like, um, you know, oilers and supply ships that you need to, to rendezvous with and do, do an unrep with? I don't know. These small windows will let you access all relevant data for each type of module such as ammunition levels for your weapon mounts or damage levels. Tactical groups can be easily selected by clicking on the fleet board on the links in the interface or in the order of battle panel on the left. 
So obviously, you know, order of battle, very important in a game. So what we're, I'm seeing here is that this person in this, they're clicking on various things like task group, right? Task force 17 is the overall command, right? And each, and that's divided up into task groups and those task groups are divided up into task units, okay? So what we just saw, they just clicked on task group 17.5 here. And over here on the plot, we saw, it seems that when they do that, they click on task group or task unit or whatever, it, it shades in different vessels on the plot here. So I think that's an immediate visual indicator of showing you what units are part of that task group or unit. Now, since they clicked on task group 17.5, it's highlighting what I'm guessing are the carriers here in the center. And we have the destroyers Morris, Anderson, Heyman, and uh, Hugh. So which must be these destroyers up here in, in the front. Okay, so that's interesting. Yeah. Also notice again the icons with the stars, or not, on the side here, and that seems to correspond with the plot as well. So obviously the Task Force 17 flagship is the Yorktown, like they mentioned. Uh, presumably you're playing as this Vice Admiral, this three-star Admiral, and that ship would be right here in the center, okay? Lexington is this one over here on the uh, starboard quarter, that, which is presumably has a two-star Admiral aboard, okay? So yeah, um, we got a one star for the USS Morris here. I'm guessing that um, each of these task units has someone with a star there. And I'm guessing that is the task unit flagship. So the Morris here, right here at the front here, that's, the, that's task unit 17.5.2's flagship. Yeah, so you know 17.2.1's flagship is the USS Minneapolis. So as indicated by those two stars, so, and so on and so forth, right, okay. So I, again, I'm just looking at the order of battle here. I'm discerning, you know, who's in command of what, how, it, how it's working and all that, you know, what units are assigned to what unit, uh, what task group, and so on and so forth. So there's that. Looking at the plot over here on the right, uh, again, where, you know, these stars would correspond to these different uh, units over here. Um, the size of the vessel must indicate what type of vessel it is. So I'm guessing all this, the destroyers here are up here in like a picket line up in front of the formation. So I'm guessing these small units up here are destroyers. We appear to have a ring of cruisers around here uh, surrounding these two carriers in the center. So huh. there's that. Do we have any... Uh, no, these are all heavy cruisers, it seems. Yeah, CA would denote a heavy cruiser. These appear to all be heavy cruisers. Uh, there's the HMAS AS Australia and the HMAS Hobart here. Um, I'm not sure what class of ship those are, and I'm not sure I can really figure out which one. It's a two-star, but it's either this one or that one. Uh, but which is it? Hmm. Anyway, so again, I, these are just things that I'm seeing immediately. Um, yeah, I like the look of it. It, it seems very, uh, fairly intuitive if you're kind of familiar with naval formations and how they, they organize themselves. Um, seeing complement over here, killed in action or MIA. Okay. Cargo, obviously, uh, I think there will be some scenario scenarios where you're going to be supporting amphibious landings. You know, the Marines are going to go ashore, right? So you got troops, supplies here. Okay. So that should be pretty interesting here. Um, yeah, I guess I want to talk about a couple other things just before we move on. Again, I'm blabbering on a lot, but from my understanding, this game will cover the time period of essentially the first year of the Pacific War. So from like December of 1941, I believe, until January of 1943. So basically 1942. So, and given their focus on historical accuracy, they're only going to have units that were available at that time. Okay, so there's no Iowa-class battleships in this particular volume of this game. Okay, in volume one of this game. So yeah, I know everybody wants to see an Iowa-class battleship go up against the Yamato. Okay, but it ain't going to happen in this volume of the game. Okay, because the Iowa-class battleships were not in commission at the time. Okay, <laughs> that's just how it works. Yeah. 
So we know it's going to cover that time period, the first year of the war. From, also, from my understanding, the overall game world only encompasses part of the Central and South Pacific. Okay. So, like a lot of the islands in the South Pacific, you know, the Solomons, New Guinea, um, things like that, you know, Midway, um, Wake Island, and so on and so forth. And maybe Hawaii might be in there. The, the game world is sizable, but it is limited. So in other words, you're not going to be able to like start off in San Diego and sail all the way to Pearl Harbor and then sail to Tokyo. Uh, it's not the game world is not that big. It's not like Silent Hunter where you have literally the entire world at your disposal. It doesn't work like that. So that's from my understanding. Um, also, there will obviously there will be no campaign in this first volume. It's going to be scenario based, okay, which is understandable. So if you want to play the Battle of Midway, you can play that or the Battle of the Coral Sea, or so on and so forth, right? So it'll be scenario-based. Um, there's not going to be a dynamic campaign. The, the units within the fleet, including the aircraft, you know, they will not, they're not going to be, they're not going to gain um, experience, you know, and little perks to their experience, right? For example, like, you know, the Homeworld series, right? It does that. It has the persistent fleet concept, you know, and like Homeworld Deserts of Karak had this um this this experience uh, mechanic in the game where the longer your units survived, the more experience and the more kind of perks they got to their to their abilities. Like the game will not have that because um, the air groups aboard carriers they frequently rotated out. You know they didn't. There was it was very very rare for an air group to stay with a carrier for a long long period of time. At least in the United States Navy. Okay, um, most of the time they would eventually rotate the experience. Um, aviators back to the mainland so they could train, you know, upcoming, you know, trainees, right? Aviators who are in training and pass on their knowledge to them. So, yeah. In contrast, this with the Japanese, where an air group was permanently assigned to a particular carrier. Now, that had its own issues, you know, but that's not the point of this. Um, again, this is focused on the US Navy, not the Japanese Navy uh, for this volume. So, there's that. Another question that I have is given that we know that there's going to be like a random battle generator, there's going to be a scenario editor as well. So you can do whatever hypothetical scenario you want. Um, will the, when you go into the game world to, to start the game and play it, is that going to be limited to a certain, you know, large area? So like, you know, I don't know, like, uh, Let's say, like, is, is the game world going to be limited to, like, a 500 by 500 mile, square mile area or something? Or whenever you load up the game to play it, will, will the entire game world, insofar as, like, the Central and South Pacific, will that be available to you regardless? That's, what I, that's one question that I have. Yeah. So, like... You know, say you just want to do something totally silly and say like, no, I'm not going to fight the Battle of the Coral Sea. We're going to turn this carrier formation around and sail back to Wake Island or something or back up to Midway or whatever, just because I feel like it. No, I know there's no enemies out there, but I just feel like, you know, no, nope, I'm peacing out. I'm going back to Midway or something. So, yeah, I'm wondering, will the entire game world, you know, as they've modeled it, will that be available when you play the game regardless of the scenario or... Will these scenarios be limited to like a, 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 a chunk of that game world, so to speak? So if you're fighting like the battle of the Eastern Solomons, are you basically only going to be have that area around like Guadalcanal and so on available to you? Or will you just be able to go off and do whatever in the rest of the game world, so to speak? That's one question I have. So yeah, is it going to be limited or is it going to be more far more open? Yeah. Given that, you know, it's not a dynamic campaign, you know, it's not the entire world, right? But it's just a good chunk of the Pacific. So, hmm. I don't know. Questions, 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 right? Moving on. Tactical groups display different information. They will give you an overall picture of the ships and aircraft they contain. The orders you will give in this mode will apply to all the units present within the group. Your complete order of battle can be displayed in this panel and will include all other allied units and bases, whether you control them or not. So they mentioned that 
you'll have access to other allied units and bases, whether or not you control them. So um, obviously, given that this game is focused on carrier warfare, um, will we also have access to, like, say, land uh, airfields, right? Like Henderson Airfield aboard, you know, I'm aboard um, Henderson Airfield on Guadalcanal once that comes into operation, right? So will we have access to, like, the Cactus Air Force? Um, I have read in forums that, yes, the developers have confirmed that aircraft will also do, like, ground attack missions. So, you know, you need to bomb, like, drop bombs or whatever on a shore installation or something. Yes, you can do that, you know, again, because you'll be supporting uh, amphibious landings. So there's that. So, uh, huh, that's interesting. I'm just, again, just kind of thinking out loud here. The formation editor allows you to reorganize the disposition of a given task force by customizing the station assigned to each ship. An easy to use interface allows you to quickly reposition single ships and divisions in the screen. Presets can be saved and reused to save some time. Using this tool, you will be able to recreate most of the historical crews and combat formations used by the US Navy in 1942. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Uh, formation editor, obviously, you know, what it says on the tin here. Um, this is, um, I think this is, a, you know, it seems pretty intuitive and easy enough to use, I'm guessing. But the question is, like, uh, the, the U.S. Navy developed a whole, you know, a number of different formations based on, to address various needs within the fleet and various threats. So, you know, whether it be like anti-submarine or anti-air, you know, so on and so forth, you know. Not to mention good old things like the battle line or, you know, whatever. Um, will the game kind of give you a historical lesson on some of these formations? Or are you going to have to kind of go off and do that, that homework yourself, so to speak? You know, reading a uh, naval manual can be an incredibly dry experience. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> As someone who's done it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, like we see here, you know, we're showing cruising disposition 3R, you know. Yeah, but... Why? Why were they using Cruising Disposition 3R? What's the point of it, right? Why did they decide to have this, you know, disposition? You know, why are the ships arranged in such a way? You know, why are the cruisers arranged in a ring around the carriers at such a distance from the carriers? So, again, there's, there's reasons for all of these things, right? So, huh. will the game tell you this or are you going to have to kind of figure it out on your own? The complex but iconic anti-air ring formations will be fully customizable based on your personal threat assessment. Once greenlit, the ships will leave their current position so as to reach their new station without hampering the course and the speed of other ships. So pausing it right there, um... Uh, from my understanding, from what I've seen so far, they've put a lot of effort into the pathfinding of these vessels in order to get this formation editor to work. And so uh, that's something that I've, you know, I, I applaud them for. You know, you may think like, oh, it's a big wide ocean. You know, how could ships possibly crash into each other? And <laughs> you would be amazed how often it actually occurs, even in the modern day with all of our, you know, radar and voyage management systems. Yeah, ships still do collide with each other with unnerving frequency. The task force is a very busy, complex environment, unfriendly to all sorts of stunts. Our AI will find the best path to its assigned destination and give way when necessary. This third mode in the fleet board allows you to set up defensive patrols over your task force. The two main types of patrols are the combat air patrol and the inner air patrol. Combat air patrols protect you against enemy air intruders, while inner air patrols are designed to counter submarines. Okay, so obviously they're, they're talking about air patrols here. A uh, very important thing. Um, fighter direction was a big thing in World War II, and it, it had a steep learning curve, right? Um, particularly, you know, radar was a very nice thing, but early radars could only just detect that something was there. Before the advent of height-finding radars, we didn't know to what altitude we had to send the combat air patrol out to, up to, 
So yeah, that was an issue. So currently, you know, it says patrol altitude at 15,000 feet. Maybe, maybe the enemy's coming in lower or higher. So if you can't determine their height, but you can determine what bearing they're coming from, well, yeah, you could have a problem. There are many instances of uh, you know, detecting an aircraft like a scout plane or something on radar and sending aircraft out to that area, but they can't find it because it's at the, they're at the wrong altitude. So, yeah, it's it's almost a toss up in a way, right? So, okay, this patrol is going out to fifteen thousand feet, but maybe the enemy's coming in at thirty thousand or maybe like twenty thousand feet or something. Yeah, who knows? Combat air patrols will be assigned a zone and an altitude. If needed, cap patrols can be set to be relieved automatically throughout the day. Attention, prepare the flight deck for our operation. As the flight deck is being prepped for future air operations, these are added to the air ops timeline at the bottom of the screen. Blue equals prep time. Red equals takeoff. Okay, again, just uh, showing the attention to detail they've put into this in terms of carrier air operations. So from my understanding, this is going to be one of the most realistic depictions of uh, simulations of carrier air ops in a video game, at least that we've seen in the modern time. So obviously they said blue is prep time. You know, red is takeoff time. So we, we obviously we have a, the Yorktown selected here. We're currently prepping the flight deck, you know, where they're pushing back aircraft. You know, we got the deck park here up front. They have to push all these aircraft back and ready the flight to take off. It's 5th of June, 1942, so almost around the time of the Battle of Midway. We see the time there, 14.05 hours. Okay. In the meantime, our destroyers are repositioning themselves. This one has found an opening between USS Yorktown and USS Lexington and crosses their trajectory without issue. Okay, so one thing I want to point out about the camera here is that we notice that the, the person controlling this, the mouse here, they move their cursor over to a unit and they click on it and the camera automatically snaps to that particular unit. Okay, so that seems pretty simple enough in the 3D world, right? You see something, you want to focus on that, you just move the mouse to it and you click, or I'm, I'm assuming you click, <laughs> and the camera snaps to it and focuses on that unit. Okay, that makes sense, right? Simple enough. Um, one thing I would kind of, I'm wondering, I should say, is will there be like a free camera in this game? So like, does the camera need to be focused on a particular unit? Or can you like use the arrow keys or the WASD keys or something to you know, maybe just move the camera around freely. It doesn't have to be focused on any particular unit. That's one thing I'm kind of wondering about. I think it would be nice to get some real cinematic shots that way, you know. Uh, maybe you you don't really want to focus on anything in particular, right? So, yeah. I, I, again, just, just a question I have, something I'm, I'm wondering. So I think that would be cool. In addition, like I said, I want kind of want, I would like more of those first-person kind of perspectives, you know. Again, one thing I should point out is that uh, when I think about simulators like this in games in general, video games in particular, is that there's no video game that does everything to a high level of detail. You know what I mean? So I'm like, in other words, when I look at this game, I'm expecting a carrier task force simulator, right? So there's going to be a good amount of surface combat involved. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. There's going to be obviously a heavy emphasis on carrier air operations and air combat and so on and so forth, right? But on a largely operational level, right? So I'm not expecting this game to be like a flight simulator, like IL-2 Sturmovic. You know, I don't, I'm not expecting this game for you to be able to jump into the cockpit of a Dauntless dive bomber and lead the attack on like the Akagi or the Kaga during Battle of Midway or whatever, you know, like your Wade McCluskey or dick best or whatever you know i'm not expecting that you know i don't think this is going to be that kind of game okay so i mean yeah i mean as we'll see you can go to different um aircraft and zoom in and follow them around with the camera but i i would not expect this game to be a flight simulator you know yeah what would be cool though i think is maybe if they included like a um a, a camera perspective where like you could see 
the um, the aircraft from inside the cockpit, you know, to kind of get a feel for like, you know, what it would be like to fly around in a dive bomber, even though you're not actually controlling it, you know? So you want to you know what Wade McCluskey felt like as he dived, you know, on one of the carriers, you know, during the Battle of Midway, you know, from the cockpit view, from his perspective, what he would have seen. That would be, I think, a cool thing. But again, I'm just, I'm kind of nitpicking on on things that would be neat. But anyway, but yeah, it seems like um, the camera in the 3D world, the way you snap between different units and focus on different things is pretty intuitive. Carrier warfare is a game of waiting, but we'd rather not have you wait forever. Time acceleration is always available, and its factor will be further increased from its current 40 times limit. Okay, so looking again, looking down at the bottom there, we have the time scale here. So obviously, we have time compression is a big thing, so you don't have to like wait around. Otherwise, it would be an incredibly boring game, right? Um, so what I'm seeing is I'm seeing obviously the pause, the play, the fast forward buttons down there, time scale, and the uh, the time acceleration factor up there. Okay, then I see one hour, four hours, and twenty four hours is what it looks like. I'm guessing that. Those are the time scales for the the bottom, the very bottom of the screen. Yeah, I'm not sure what it's currently set at, maybe four hours or something, but I'm guessing the, that one, four, and the 24 hours are for the time scale at the bottom here, how focused you want that to be. Yeah. So, and it says it will go, you'll eventually be able to accelerate time beyond the current um, cap of 40, 40 times. So there's that. You know, some of these carrier battles went on for several days. So yeah, this this game is not going to be like, a, you know, presumably you could play the entire thing in real time <laughs> if you wanted to. If you wanted to play all several days of the Battle of Midway in real time, presumably you could do that. But I don't know if you'd really want to. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, there's that. The time has come for our Wildcats to launch. Enjoy the show. Aircraft all have a flight model, even on the flight deck. Right now in this demo, conditions are ideal, but the final game will require your task force to head into the wind in order to launch and land its aircraft, disrupting your navigation. Plan. All right, that's another important thing, and something that actually that that one detail it may seem like kind of small, you know, but the fact that you're you're going to have to be to turn your task force or at least your carrier into the wind to launch aircraft. That small little detail is something I've never seen thus far in a modern game featuring aircraft carriers. Not in like command modern operations or in Car carrier command two or whatever. In both those games, it doesn't matter which way your carrier is pointed, you just launch the aircraft. No. In real life, and even today, carriers will turn into the wind because you need to get wind over the deck in order for the wings to generate enough lift for aircraft to take off. So the fact that they put that deal it, detail in here will be interesting. Also notice in the background, you have a destroyer that's trailing the carrier. That's the plane guard. Okay, so it's following the carrier in case any of these aircraft goes into the drink when it takes off, you know, and the pilot manages to get out, that destroyer will come and pick them up. So from my understanding, um, rescuing downed aircrew will be... Uh, some form of gameplay mechanic in here so eh. again these, these little attention to 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 technical details here is something that i'm really really interested in it shows me that the developer here is you know has done their homework all the radio messages and announcement in this demonstration are placeholders of course Final quality will be improved. Yeah, that's understandable. Again, work in progress. The animations and the, the voice acting is still a little rough, but 
<laughs> Presumably it will improve. Action can be paused at all times and is active, allowing you to browse. Oops, sorry. Let me uh, go back just a smidge there. So I want to go on that menu. They just and glanced is over. Active, allowing you to there we go. Okay, so, so in that view menu, what I'm seeing is contact history, wind, weather, radar ranges, main battery ranges, and uh, anti-air artillery ranges. Okay, so you can view different factors here separate from the 3d world view so if you want to see where the wind is coming from so you can turn into the wind weather will be interesting I, again we do know weather will play a factor in here right uh presumably i'm like in real life historically weather also heavily factored into the accuracy of like um aircraft attacks right if there's a low cloud cover over a carrier uh dive bombers had to get through that cloud cover had to dive through that cl those clouds and if they're low enough then their accuracy is going to be off because then they have to like reorient themselves and find their targets once they get through that cloud cover when they're diving so things like that um squalls right yeah wind so on right i'm wondering will how much of a factor is weather going to play into this game into the air operations into the sailing so to speak you know um are we going to encounter really, really ugly weather? Contact history. Now, from my understanding, a lot of what this game is, at, the core of this game, of what it's simulating is command, control, and communications. And I guess to some extent, intelligence as well. So another big question that I have for how this game is played is how are um, contact reports, how are they varied, so to speak? For instance, say you send off a flight of scouts, of dauntless dive bombers to scout out an area and they radio back to you a, you know, a contact report. Say like, oh yeah, we found like three battleships and one carrier out here, you know, headed, in, you know, east and going at roughly this speed, you know, so send a strike, you'll launch a strike and send them out here, you know. So you, you get your strike ready, you launch, it flies out to where we believe it's going to be, and it turns out like, oh, those aren't battleships, those are cruisers, or th th that's not a carrier, that's, a, that's an oiler or something like that, you know? Yes, uh, false or inaccurate contact reports happened with frequency <laughs> in World War II, right? Um, or maybe they got the direction wrong, and you end up sending out a flight of you know, torpedo bombers and they get out there and there's nothing out there. You know, it's like, what, where, where's this, this big, this contact that you, you told us about, you know, there's, there's, I'm not seeing anything out here except water, you know? Yes. Those types of things did happen. So from my understanding, from what I've researched, the developer is working in, um, a mechanic where there's going to be variations in the accuracy of the contact reports. So my question is, how is that, is that going to work? Is it going to be like, um, a randomized kind of dice roll or, you know, RNG or something or whatever, or are certain parts of the, you know, like is the entire contact report just going to be up for, you know, the dice roll and, you know, it's either going to be accurate or not, or are certain parts of it going to be accurate, you know, and varied, or is it going to be dependent on the weather, you know, maybe there was some clouds or fog or whatever, and they didn't get a good look at the enemy or whatever contacts were down there or something. Maybe it was getting dark or something, so they couldn't see very well, or, you know, maybe that these pilots are kind of at a lower experience level, you know, so maybe they tend to misidentify ships or something, you know, all these different factors can play into that. So one of the big things, gameplay elements of this game, from my understanding, is going to be based on you receiving reports, contact reports, you know, based on scouts or reconnaissance or whatever. And making a decision based on that. That would be one area where a certain randomness, so to speak, within reason, within certain factors, um, will add a great deal of, you know, accuracy and variety to the gameplay, I think. So I'm hoping that they get that part, you know, done intelligently, you know, hopefully not to an extreme where it like it feels really artificial, you know. You got to balance out, balance that out, so to speak. But, you know, like, oh, I keep getting back these contact reports 
and it's a bright, sunny, clear day out, but yet the, all these contact reports are inaccurate, and I keep sending off planes to the middle of nowhere, and some of them aren't even coming back, you know? Yes, that did happen as well in World War II, you know? Planes with flights of aircraft would go off, and they would literally, like, never come back. So yeah, these pilots, bear in mind, there was no GPS or anything like that, so these pilots had a compass, a map, and a, and a stopwatch, and that's how they navigated. Yeah. Now, yes, some carriers did have like um, beacons that they could transmit and um, you could use like a, a radio direction finder to home in on that transmitter. But even that, you know, early on in the war, the, they were a little bit iffy, at, you know, so to speak. You know, a lot of this technology, the radars, the, the direction finding and all that, it was still kind of new at the time. So, yeah, I'm wondering, again, a lot of the stuff that I'm thinking about is historically based, but... Can we really expect all of these, these things to be implemented in the game, right? My imagination, our imaginations can dream up so many different scenarios and different little details and stuff. But the question is, is that reasonable to expect the developers to implement all these things into the game, right? Maybe what I'm thinking about, maybe the weather won't play really that big of a factor in the gameplay. I don't know. Maybe it'll largely just be there for show, for, for show, <laughs> for, for, you know, just for looks, for aesthetics, you know? Or maybe um, the contacts, the contact reports will be pretty accurate, you know, like 90% of the time or something, you know, I don't know. But given the fact that they're heavily focused on historical accuracy in this game, let's just say that they have their work cut out for them. I'm fully expecting a lot of the features in this game to be kind of janky, you know, as it starts out. So again, I'm tempering my hopes for this game. To browse through your units and your options. It can be customized and made inactive if you wish to increase difficulty. Let me go back a second. I think they moused over the camera menu. I want to see that. if you wish to increase difficulty. And is active, allowing you to browse through your units and... Okay, here we go. Yeah. So what I see is stop tracking orbit. Okay, so you can modify the, 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 the camera, the filter the camera features here. You got a chase cam, a hood cam. That, I mean, that might be kind of an in-cockpit type of view. That might be pretty interesting. You know, uh, left wing, right wing, flyby. Okay, interesting. And, you know, stop tracking. So I'm guessing if you do that, you know, th these various things you check, you know, I saw, yeah, I think there, it, there will be some, again, just based on this menu, I think there will be some kind of free camera, you know, where you can just move the camera around at will or something or, yeah. Okay. Again, these are just things that I'm seeing. Again, it's still a work in progress, so. You know, some of these features may be changed or, you know, added or omitted in the final product. I don't know. And your options. It can be customized and made inactive if you wish to increase difficulty. Red leader, section airborne. The tactical view also allows you to follow your air units in flight. These are organized into flights, although each and every plane is still visible on the map. The cap you launched is now climbing. Fighter direction screen offers you means to control Mobile your airborne patrols here. at the most critical time. Unknown and Nine enemy contacts are miles. reported too. Bogies are indicated in yellow. These are unidentified air contacts. When finally classified as hostile, they will become bandits and will be labeled in red. Fighter direction can be set to auto or manual mode depending on the time you wish to dedicate to this task. Leader, Here, fighters are vectored now, towards bogies. As IFF Angel, gear becomes left. more and more common in the course of 1942, the job of fighter director might become somewhat easier too. But mistakes are still a thing, and you can never be too sure. All right, let me pause it right there. So at the very beginning, we noticed that FDO, that stands for Fighter Direction Officer, um, that was checkmarked, and they... They clicked it to turn it off. So presumably, again, that's a that's a kind of an automated feature, as they mentioned in this game. 
um, again, sim- um, symbolic of or representing the fact that, you know, it's not, you're not doing as the Admiral, you're not doing everything, you know, you're not physically at the helm steering this boat, right? Um, you know, that's what quartermasters are for. You know, you're not in command of this particular ship. That's what the captain is for. You know, you're in command of the task force. So, and you have a staff with you, you know, you would have fighter direction officers who would do this for you. Now, unfortunately, you know, they show these things, you know, popped up over here, but, you know, after they turn this off, presumably that sets it so you can fiddle with it as well. Um, And they went down here and clicked on something, I'm guessing defend base or something, because that's highlighted. Yeah. So I, I don't know. So you know, they moved the mouse down here. You know, something was covering this, this part of the screen, so we couldn't see what they clicked on. But now the fighters are automatically vectoring to intercept. So again, I'm assuming with this FDO in charge box checked, then it'll do it automatically. And if you uncheck it, then presumably you can use some of these options or whatever down here and modify what you want the planes to do, right? Clear the flight deck, all fighters, free for all. All planes stay clear, okay? Um, I'm guessing focus on the torpedo bombers or focus on the, the dive bombers so you can order your combat air patrol, your fighters, to focus on certain attacking aircraft. You know, if torpedo bombers and dive bombers are coming at you, maybe you want to focus, order them to attack certain ones or something, you know? Yeah, fighter direction was a big thing, and it was one of those things that had a really steep learning curve in World War II, and it's something uh, both... You know, the U.S. Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy, um, you know, had quite a bit of practice, you know, working on and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Again, just look at, just study any of the the carrier battles of the war and you'll find, you know, successes and failures on aplenty on both sides, you know. <laughs> a 2D view offers only so much info. If you are playing at a more forgiving level of realism, you can also switch to the tactical view for a better picture. I like what it says down here, these contact reports. Yeah, Romeo to Red Leader, your target is now Vector 270, 10 miles, Angels 10 plus. Okay, Angels as in altitude in thousands of feet. Yeah, this is Red Leader, Roger out. Okay, yeah. When I think of Red Leader, I don't know about you, but I think of Star Wars. (laughs) Yep, Red 5 standing by. Yep. Fighters have visually identified this the boat. They are now Howling hostile. Howling Your pilots Howling are engaging, Howling and the task force is now preparing for air now. defense. Zero quarter, zero quarter, go ahead, manual battle station. Set five for air attack. The situation doesn't look too bright from here. Let's see how it actually feels like out there, from the point of view of the enemy zeros. Indeed, these Zeros do enjoy a good altitude advantage over the unlucky American fighters, as these are still climbing in order to reach them. But American fighter pilots are also resourceful. Similar engagements can bear very different outcomes owing to AI choices, circumstances, and sheer luck. Okay, let me pause it here real quick. I'm going to talk a little bit about, again, about some of the artificial intelligence in this game. I know they've worked a significant amount on making the artificial intelligence feel realistic in terms of the tactics they used, particularly when when it comes to the dog fights, so to speak. There's been other videos out there of them showcasing kind of how they're working with the dog fight artificial intelligence, so to speak. Yeah. So hopefully that they'll get that down pretty well. Okay. So that's why I'm hoping I'm hoping the artificial intelligence is fairly good. Now, Important thing to understand, again, I'm not a programmer, but from my understanding, the way a lot of artificial intelligence in video games is not some super, you know, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, advanced thinking, learning machine, computer, or whatever. A lot of the way artificial intelligence works in video games is it's it operates on a kind of if-then type of logic. You know, like if the player does this, then the the AI is going to do, you know, you know, that right? Or maybe there's a little bit of variation in there, you know? So if the player does this, then the AI will have a choice between doing option one, two, and three, and maybe, you know, there's like a 40% chance it's going to do option one, and a 20% chance it's going to do option two, 
and like uh, another 40% chance it's going to do option three or something like that, you know? So, you know, there'll be branching paths to the artificial intelligence and the way it makes decisions, but most artificial intelligence in video games works on an if then sort of, uh, you know, logic pathway. Yeah. So it's not some super advanced whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, it, artificial, good artificial intelligence in a video game can really make or break the immersion, right? Uh, how many of us have played video games where the AI is dumb as a box of rocks? Or on the opposite extreme, is just so good, it's like omniscient. Like you get sniped from like the, from like, you know, five miles away by an enemy with a pistol or something, you know, it's like, what, how could the enemy possibly know I was over here? You know, they know everything. They, they're, you know, they're far faster than any human can ever react. You know, so that either of those extremes is immersion breaking and an artificial intelligence that basically is cheating and is way too good or an artificial intelligence that is incredibly stupid and, you know, blind, deaf and dumb. You know, you don't want either of those. You want it somewhere in the middle. Furthermore, right, I imagine this is very difficult to do, but getting the artificial intelligence to use historically accurate tactics, right? Like, you know, we all know that how ferocious and incredible of a, a dogfighter the Zero was, particularly when it came to a turning dogfight, you know, and the tactics that the Allies, had, that the U.S. Navy had to develop in terms of like, you know, like the thatch weave or whatever, you know, um, with the Wildcat. So they had to develop tactics to kind of bait the zeros, you know, you know, and with the later introduction of more powerful aircraft, you know, the Hellcat or the Corsair or whatever, right? Even then they said, don't get into a turning dogfight with a zero. You are going to lose, you know, use the power of your engine. You can fly faster and dive faster and climb better than the zero, you know? Um, yeah, you know, use like kind of boom and zoom tactics, you know, not to mention, of course, you know, um, more of these aircraft, you know, as, as time went on and more aircraft came into service, right? A lot of the American aircraft were far more rugged and had a bit more armor to protect the pilots and stuff like that. The Zero, you know, did not enjoy those advantages. They didn't have self-sealing fuel, fuel tanks, you know. They sacrificed a lot of durability and ruggedness for speed so they can keep the weight down, right? So once you hit a Zero, the thing's pretty much going to go down in flames. Yeah. And for, you know, the size of engine, you know, that being said, you know, the zero was pretty impressive for, you know, for the time, given the size of the engine that it had, you know, it was only about a thousand horsepower in that engine, you know, maybe a little bit less, but, you know, it depends on the model. So I'm wondering, you know, will things like that, you know, will the, the build quality of the aircraft, you know, are we going to see that play into dogfights, you know, are we going to see accurate Japanese and American tactics and dogfighting and things like that. So, yeah. Hmm. Here's the hope. And again, I think this might be the case of like, I'm just imagining an artificial intelligence that is far more intricate than what is in here. But what we're seeing so far, though, I think is, is pretty good. The final game will feature believable aircraft damage models and ballistics. With more than 30 aircraft types modeled so as to faithfully recreate the air battles of 1942, prepare for some hectic dogfights in the skies over your task force. Okay, so we saw that uh, Wildcat get on its uh, get on that 06 there, so. Okay, so let me pause it right there for a second, uh, kind of as we're looking at it. We see some, you know, some islands here, some flying boats, which is pretty cool. Some nice weather and atmospheric effects, which look really cool. I've seen some uh, simulations of the way they handle clouds and the changing cloud cover and all that. That looks really, really good, in my opinion. They are putting a good amount of time into working on the, the surface combat as well. You know, like cruisers and destroyers and battleships fighting each other. There is a, um, a screen capture out there of, you know, like uh, ships in the middle of the night and there's like star shells going up, you know, and illuminating the area. So they have noted, the developers have noted that surface combat will be fairly complex. I mean, to an extent, you know, but which is to say, like, they're putting time into looking at like armor penetration values and things like that, making it 
the surface combat roughly as intricate and detailed as like a game like Fighting Steel or, you know, various other kinds of naval war games and so on and so forth. So it will be the damage models, the armor values and all that presumably will be fairly historically accurate, at least as far as as accurate as the simulation can make it, so to speak. So um, surface combat will be a, a pretty, I think, a hefty chunk of this game, or at least you'll be able to simulate them. That brings me to another question of, will, these, will all of these scenarios be solely carrier-based? Because, I mean, if, again, all you have to do is look at the history and know that there were quite a number of battles, you know, around Guadalcanal and in the Solomon Islands that did not involve carriers. Of course, you know, you have the Eastern Solomons, you have Santa Cruz and, you know, and so on and so forth, you know, but you have like the naval battles of Guadalcanal, um, the Battle of Cape Esperance, you know, uh, Vela Gulf, Vela La Vela, you know, so on and so forth. None of those battles involve carriers. Some of those battles were gunfights between destroyers and cruisers and even a few battleships in the middle of the night. My question is, can you build a scenario and play a scenario in the game that doesn't even have a carrier in it? I don't know about you, but I want to see the naval battles of Guadalcanal played out in this game. Like, I want to play, you know, as the Americans, the battleship Washington and South Dakota engaging the Kirishima, you know, during the second naval battle of Guadalcanal. You know, I want to imagine, try to imagine what the first naval battle of Guadalcanal was like, because descriptions of it are hectic and chaotic. One officer described the first naval battle of Guadalcanal as being like a bar, bar room brawl where the lights had been shot out. It was literally, you know, the American and the Japanese formations became intermixed in the middle of the night. It was pitch black outside, essentially. And all of a sudden, just everyone just opened up on each other. And they were within like a thousand yards of their targets. And it was just chaotic. There was like gunfire going every which way. Torpedoes were going into the water. Like one American ship got caught in a crossfire between a Japanese and another American ship and got shot up from both sides, you know, it was absolute chaos, you know. How good, I want to see some gameplay footage of some surface combat and see how that looks, right? How good is the the artificial intelligence at modeling surface battles? That, that would be interesting. And furthermore, um, will like destroyers, like Japanese destroyers or cruisers, be making torpedo runs? with, you know, with their surface-fired torpedoes, right? We've all heard of the Type 93 Long Lance Torpedo, you know, and the Japanese extensive use of that with their destroyers. So, yeah, will it be, you know, will you have gunfire and torpedoes going into the water and so on and so forth, you know? That's why I'm wondering. I'm wondering how good is the is the AI going to handle surface combat? And furthermore, can you create and play scenarios with just surface forces? like the battles of Guadalcanal or Savo Island or, you know, so on and so forth. You know what I mean? That's another thing that I'm looking forward to and something that I want to see. Yeah. Um, I guess lastly, I should say is that, um, you know, submarines, uh, from my understanding, will not be controllable because submarines often operated on their own or, you know, separate from carrier task forces. Enemy submarines, and I think uh, U.S. submarines are, are modeled in the game. And they, you can encounter um, Japanese submarines because there, there is a, I've seen an AI, um, an artificial intelligence like tree based on how like, you know, um, the destroyers will prosecute a, a submarine contact, you know, based on how many depth charges or whatever they have, you know, and whether they can find it, you know, and prosecute that contact and so on and so forth. So yes, submarines will play a factor, you know, there have been, there are instances, right, of of carriers getting torpedoed in the Pacific, you know, just look up the history. So yes, submarines were a thing um, and they will be a thing in the game. But um, yeah, again, this is not Silent Hunter. Okay, so don't expect that. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see how the game handles um, anti-submarine warfare with respect to what it's designed to do, so to speak, with respect to you commanding the carrier task force and all that. So yeah, I, I would like to see, you know, uh, gameplay footage of some surface combat and see how the, how the game handles that. Yeah. 
So I think it will be interesting. Anyway. We got some uh, torpedo bombers there. Some Val dive bombers. I'm guessing Dauntless dive bombers. And again, all this we're seeing right now is kind of previously released footage of the gameplay. So yeah. Again, some of the graphics are still kind of, you know, a little bit rough around the edges, you know, not the most detailed, but uh, yeah, I think it's still kind of a work in progress, but what they have so far is pretty good. Um, in conclusion, since the, the video is almost over, I just want to end off by saying I think I'm really excited for this game. Uh, I see it as something as having a lot of potential. Whether or not they fulfill that potential is, you know, still up in the air, right? Game developers can promise you the world and end up completely tanking and falling short. Again, you know, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 is a very recent example of, you know, being this incredibly hyped up game. And upon release, people are like, oh, this, this is, yeah, this game really need, needed another year or two in development. So, um, from my understanding, the developers of Task Force Admiral do not plan to do early access. They, they intend to, you know, you know, get the, the, the mechanics down and the gameplay and the scenarios built and all ready for release, you know, um, as it should be, you know, of course, you know, there'll probably be some bugs and things like that, you know, in, in the, when the game is released, but yeah. So, I mean, um, it's not going to be perfect probably, but I think, um, like I said, this game has a lot of potential. I think it'll be really interesting assuming it actually does get released. So I'm, I have high hopes for it, but I'm, tempering my expectations for it but i think what we've seen so far is definitely a step in a very interesting direction and i think if this game accomplishes even half of the things it sets out to do you know and what the developers claim it should be doing then i think this game will be right up my alley and especially in terms of the the history that i love to research and read about so yeah. Anyway, um, that's really all I have to say for this. I've got one. He's going down in flames. That's all for today, folks. See you for the next feature. Number two, check your sticks.